Section 38 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 19 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 2, by Ida L. Pfeiffer. In this region we continually wander among ruins, and see everywhere around us the relics of the past. Thus a short walk brought us from Cicero's villa to the remains of three temples, those of Diana, Venus, and Mercury. Of the first, one side and a few little cells, called the Baths of Venus, alone remain. Part of Venus's temple stands in the rotunda. It was built on acoustic principles, so that any one who puts his ear to a certain part of the wall can hear what is whispered at the opposite extremity. A few fragments of the rotunda were the only trace left of the temple of Diana. The vapor baths of Nero, hewn out of the rock, consist of several passages, into which it is impossible to penetrate far on account of the heat. A boy ran to the spring and brought us some boiling water. He returned from his expedition fiery red in the face, and covered with perspiration. These poor lads are accustomed to remain at the spring until they have succeeded in boiling some eggs but I would not allow any such cruelty, and did not even wish them to fetch me the water. But Herr Brettschneider would have it so in spite of me. From this place we crossed by sea to Bailly, where at one time many of the rich people had their villas. Their proceedings here are said, however, to have been of so immoral a character, that at length it was considered wrong to have resided here any time." Every visitor must be enchanted with the fertility of this region, and with its lovely aspect. A castle, now used as a barrack for veterans, crowns the summit of a rock which stands prominently forth. A few unimportant traces can still be here discovered of an ancient temple of Hercules. Some masonry, in the form of a monument, marks the alleged spot where Agrippina was murdered and buried by order of her son. The immense reservoir built by order of the Emperor Augustus for the purpose of supplying the fleet with fresh water is situate in the neighborhood of Bailly. It is called Piscina. This giant structure contains several large chambers, their roofs supported by numerous columns. To view this reservoir we are compelled to descend a flight of steps. Not far from the before-mentioned building we come upon the Cento Camarelle, a prison consisting of a multitude of small cells. On our way back we visit Sofaltara, the celebrated crater plain, about one thousand feet in length by eight hundred in breadth, skirted by hills. Its volcanic power is not yet wholly extinct. In several places brimstone fumes, whence the plain derives its name, are still seen rising into the air, which they impregnate with a most noxious odor. On striking the ground with a stick a sound is produced, from which we can judge that the whole space beneath us is hollow. The excursion is a very disagreeable one. We are continually marching across a mere crust of earth, which may give way at any moment. I found here a manufactory of brimstone and alum, a little church belonging to the Capuchins, where we are shown a stone on which St. Genarius was decapitated after the bears had refused to tear him to pieces, stands on a hill near the Solfatara. Towards evening we reached the dog's grotto. A huntsman from the royal preserve Astroni accompanied us, and fetched the man who keeps the keys of the grotto. This functionary soon appeared with a couple of dogs, to furnish us with a practical illustration of the convulsions caused by the foul air of the cavern. But I declined the experiment, and contented myself with viewing the grotto. It is of small extent, about eight or ten feet long, not more than five in breadth, and six or eight high. I entered the cave, and so long as I remained erect felt no inconvenience. So soon as I bent towards the ground, however, and the lower stratum of air blew upon my face, I experienced a most horrible choking sensation. After we had satisfied our curiosity, the huntsman led us to the neighboring hunting lodge, and to a little lake where a number of ducks are fattened. This man spoke of another and much more remarkable grotto, of which he possessed the keys, and which he should have great pleasure in showing us. Though twilight was rapidly approaching, we determined to go, as the place was not far off. The man opened the door, and invited us to enter the cavern, 
advising us at the same time to bend down open-mouthed, as we had done in the dog's grotto, and at the same time to fan the air upwards with our hands, so that we might the better inhale it, a proceeding which he asserted to be peculiarly good for the digestive organs. His eloquence was so powerful that we could not help suspecting the man, and it struck us as very strange that he was so particularly anxious we should enter the cavern together. This, therefore, we refused to do, and Herr Brutschneider remained outside with our guide, while I entered alone and did as he had directed. Though the lower stratum of air in the dog's grotto had been highly mephitic, the atmosphere here was more stifling still. I rushed forth with the speed of lightning, and now we clearly saw through the fellow's intention. If Herr Brutschneider and myself had entered together, he would undoubtedly have shut the door, and we should have been stifled in a few moments. We did not allow him to notice our suspicions, but merely said that we could not spend any more time here to-day on account of the lateness of the hour. Our worthy friend accompanied us through a wild and gloomy region, with his gun on his shoulder, and I was not a little afraid of him, for he kept talking about his honesty and the good intentions he had towards us. We kept, however, close beside him, and watched him narrowly, without betraying any symptom of apprehension, and at length, to our great relief, we gained the open road. The royal villa of Portici lies about four miglia from Naples, and we made an excursion thither by railway. Both the palace and the gardens are handsome, and of considerable size. Thence we proceed to Racina. Portici and Racina are so closely connected together by villas and houses that a stranger would take them for one place. Beneath Racina lies Herculaneum, a city destroyed seventy-nine years after the birth of our Saviour. In the year 1689 a Marquis caused a well to be dug in his garden, when, at a depth of sixty-five feet, the labourers came upon fragments of marble with diverse inscriptions. It was not until 1720 that systematic excavations were made. Even then great caution was necessary, as Rosina is unfortunately built upon Herculaneum, and the safety of the houses became endangered. At Rosina we procured torches and a guide, and ascended to view the subterranean city. We saw the theatre, a number of houses, several temples, and the forum. Some fine frescoes are still to be distinguished on the walls of the apartments. The floors are covered with mosaic, but still this place does not offer nearly so many objects of interest as another which was overwhelmed at the same time, Pompeii. Pompeii is without doubt the most remarkable city of its kind that exists. A great portion of the town is surrounded by walls, and entire rows of houses, several temples, the theatre, the forum, in short a vast number of buildings, streets, and squares lay open before us. The more I wandered through the streets and open places, the more I involuntarily wondered not to find the inhabitants and laborers employed in repairing the houses, I could hardly realize the idea that so many beautiful houses and well-preserved apartments should be untenanted. The deserted aspect of this town had a very melancholy effect in my eyes. Though a great portion of the town has already been dug out, only three hundred skeletons have been found a proof that the greater portion of the inhabitants effected their escape. In many houses I found splendid, tessellated pavements, representing flowers, wreaths, animals, and arabesques. Even the halls and courtyards were decorated with the larger kind of mosaic work. The walls of the rooms are plastered over with a description of firm, polished enamel, frequently looking like marble, and covered with beautiful frescoes. In Salust's house a whole row of wine-jugs still stands in the cellar. In the houses the division of the rooms, and the purposes to which the different apartments were devoted, can still be distinctly traced. In general they are very small, and the windows seldom look out upon the street. Deep ruts of carriages can still be seen in the streets. All the treasures of art which could be removed, such as statues, pictures, etc., were carried off to Naples and placed in the museum there. In the agreeable society of Herr M. and Madame Brettschneider, I rode away from Racina at eleven in the forenoon. A pleasant road, winding among vineyards, brought us in an hour's time to the neighborhood of the great lava field, Torre del Greco. It is a fearful sight to behold these grand mounds of lava towering in a most various form around us. 
all traces of vegetation have vanished. Far and wide we can descry nothing but hardened masses, which once rushed in molten streams down the mountain. A capitally constructed road leads us, without the slightest fatigue, through the midst of this scene of devastation, to the usual resting place of travellers, the hermitage. At this dwelling we made halt, ascended to the upper story, and called for a bottle of lacrime Christi. The view here, and at several other points of our ascent, is most charming. The hermit seems, however, to lead anything but a solitary life, for a day seldom passes on which strangers do not call in to claim his attention in proportion as they run up a score. The clerical gentleman is, in fact, no more and no less than a very common innkeeper, and partakes of the goodly obesity frequently noticed among persons of his class. We stayed three-quarters of an hour in the domicile of this hermit host, and afterwards rode on toward the heights, along a beautiful road amid fields of lava. In half an hour's time, however, we were completely shut in by lava fields, and here the beaten track ended. We now dismounted and continued our ascent on foot. It is difficult for one who has not seen it to picture to himself the scene that lay around us. Devastation everywhere, lava covering the whole region in heaps upon heaps, fantastically piled one on the other. Here a large isolated mound rises, seemingly cut off on all sides from the lava around. There we see how a mighty stream once rushed down the mountain side and cooled gradually into stone. Immense chasms are filled with lava masses, which have lain here for many years cold and motionless, and will probably remain for as many more, for their fury has spent itself. The lava is of different colors, according as it has been exposed to the atmosphere for a longer or a shorter period. The oldest lava has the hue of granite, and almost its hardness, for which reasons it is largely used for building houses and paving streets. From the place where we left our donkeys we had to climb upwards for nearly an hour over the lava before reaching the crater. The ascent is somewhat fatiguing, as we are obliged to be very careful at every step to avoid entangling our feet among the blocks of lava. Still, the difficulty is not nearly so great as people make out. It is merely necessary to wear good thick boots, and then all goes extremely well. The higher we mount, the more numerous do the fissures become from which smoke bursts forth. In one of these clefts we placed some eggs, which were completely boiled in four minutes' time. Near these places the ground is so hot that we could not have stood still for many minutes. Still, we did not get burnt feet or anything of the kind. On reaching the crater we found ourselves enveloped in so thick a fog that we could not see ten paces in advance. There was nothing for it but to sit down and wait patiently until the sun could penetrate the mist and spread light and cheerfulness among us. Then we descended into the crater, and approached as closely as possible to the place from which the smoky column whirls into the air. The road was a gloomy one, for we were shut in as in a bowl, and could discern around us nothing but mountains of lava, while before us rose the huge smoky column, threatening each moment to shroud us in darkness as the wind blew it in clouds in our direction. When the ground was struck with a stick, it gave forth a hollow rumbling sound like at Solfatara. In the neighborhood of the column of smoke we could see nothing more than at the edge from which we had climbed downwards, a peculiar picture of unparalleled devastation. The circumference of the crater seems not to have changed since the visit of Herr Luwald, who a few years ago estimated its dimensions at five thousand feet. After once more mounting to the brim we walked round a great part of the edge of the basin. At the particular desire of Herr M who was well acquainted with all the remarkable points about the volcano, our guide now led the way to the so-called Hell, a little crater which formed itself in the year 1834. To reach it we had to climb about over fields of lava for half an hour. The aspect of this Hell did not strike me as particularly grand. An uneven wall of lava suddenly rose fifteen paces in advance of us, with a whole strata of pure sulphur and other beautifully colored substances depending from its projecting angles. One of these substances was of a snowy white color, light and very porous. I took a piece with me, but the next day on proceeding to pack it carefully, I found that above half had melted and become quite soft and damp, so that I was compelled to throw the whole away. 
The same thing happened to a mass of a red color that I had brought away with me, and which had a beautiful effect, like glowing lava, clinging to the fissures and sides of the rocks. We held pieces of paper to the fissures in this wall, and they immediately became ignited. Herr M. then threw in a cigar, which also burst into flame. The heat proceeding from these clefts was so great that we could not bear to hold our hands there for an instant. We laid our ears to the ground, and could hear a rushing, bubbling sound as though water was boiling beneath us. There was really much to see in this hell, without the discomfort of being enveloped in the offensive, sulphurous smoke of the chief crater. After staying for several hours in and about the crater we left it, and returned by the steep way over the cone of cinders. The descent here is almost perpendicular, and we could hardly escape with whole skins if it were not for the fact that we sink ankle-deep into sand and cinders at every step. To avoid falling, it is requisite to bend the body backwards and step upon the heel. By observing this precaution, the worst that can happen to one is to sit down involuntarily once or twice, without danger to life or limb. In twelve minutes we had reached the spot where our donkeys stood. We reached Racina during the darkness of night, having spent eight hours in our excursion. My last trip was to the castle of Caserta, distant sixteen miglia from Naples, in the direction of Capua. It is considered one of the finest pleasure palaces in Europe, and I was exceedingly pleased with its appearance. The building is of a square form, with a portico five hundred and seven feet long, supported by ninety-eight columns of the finest marble. The staircase and halls in the upper story alone must have cost enormous sums, as well as the chapel on the first floor, which is very rich and gorgeous. The saloons and apartments are decorated in a peculiarly splendid manner, with a multiplicity of frescoes, oil paintings, sculptures, gildings, costly silk hangings, marbles, etc. A pretty little theatre, with well-painted scenery, is to be found in the palace. The garden is extensive, particularly as regards length. A hill from which a considerable stream rushes foaming over artificial rockwork into the deeper recesses of the garden, rises at its extremity. Scarcely has this river sunk to rest, flowing slowly and majestically through a bed formed of large square stones, before it is compelled to form another cascade, and another, and one more, until it almost reaches the castle, near which a large basin has been constructed, from whence the water is led into the town. Seen from the portico, these waterfalls have a lovely appearance. From Caserta we drove ten miles farther on to the celebrated aqueduct, which supplies the whole of Naples with water. It is truly a marvelous work. Over three stupendous arched ways, one above the other, the necessary quantity of water flows into the city. This was my last excursion. On the following day, the 7th of November, at three in the morning, I left Naples. Apart from the delightful reminiscences of lovely natural scenes, I shall always think with pleasure on my sojourn in Naples in connection with Herr Brettschneider and his lady. I was a complete stranger to them when I delivered my note of introduction, and yet they at once welcomed me as kindly and heartily as though I had belonged to their family. How many hours, and even days, did they not devote to me, to accompany me sometimes to one place, sometimes to another? How eagerly did they seek to show me all the riches of nature and art displayed in this favored city? I was truly proud and delighted at having found such friends, and once more do I offer them my sincere thanks. End of section 38「Section 39 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 20 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1 by Ida L. Pfeiffer. November 7th. I travelled by the mail carriage. By seven in the morning we were at Caserta, and an hour later at Capua, a pretty, bustling town on the banks of a river. Our road was most picturesque. We drove among vineyards and gardens through the midst of a lovely plain. On the right were mountains, increasing in number as we proceeded, and imparting a rich variety to the landscape. At noon we halted before a lovely inn. 
From this point the country increases in beauty at every step. The heights are strikingly fertile, and in the valley an excellent road winds amid pleasant gardens. The mountains frequently seem to approach as though about to form an impenetrable pass, while ruins crown the summits of the rocks and give a romantic appearance to the whole. At about three o'clock we reached the little town of Jeromania, lying in the midst of vegetable gardens. Above this town the handsome convent of Monte Cassino stands on a rock, and in its neighborhood we notice the ruins of an amphitheater. Today the weather was not in the least Italian, being, on the contrary, gloomy and rough, as we generally find it in Austria at the same time of the year. Yesterday it was so cold at Naples that Mount Vesuvius was covered with snow during several hours. The dress of the peasants in these regions is of a more national character than I had yet found it. The women wear short and scanty petticoats of blue or red cloth, tight-fitting bodices, and gaily striped aprons. Their headdress consists of a white handkerchief, with a second above it folded in a square form. The men look like robbers, with their long, dark blue or brown cloaks, in which they wrap themselves so closely that it is difficult to get a glimpse of their faces, and their steeple-crowned black hats, they quite resemble the pictures of the bandits in the Abruzzi. They glide about in so spectral a manner, and I travelers with such a sinister look, that I almost became uncomfortable. From Geromania we still had a few miles to travel until we entered the Roman territory near Soprano. In Naples, and in fact throughout the whole of Italy, the passports are continually called for, a great annoyance to the traveler. In the course of today my passport was visé five times, making once in every little town through which we had passed. It was our fortune at Soprano to lodge with the very cheating host. In the evening, when I inquired the price of a bedroom and breakfast, they told me a bed would cost two pauls, and breakfast half a pall. But when I came to pay, the host asked three pauls for my bedroom, and another for a cup of the worst coffee I have ever drunk, and the whole company was subjected to the same extortion. We expostulated and complained, but were at length compelled to comply with the demand. November 8th. The landscape remains the same, but the appearance of the towns and villages is not nearly so neat and pretty as in the Neapolitan domain. The costume of the peasants is like that worn by the people whom we met yesterday, excepting that the women have a stiff stomacher, fastened with a red lace, instead of the spencer. The dress of the men consists of short knee breeches, brown stockings, heavy shoes, and a jacket of some dark color. Some wear, in addition to this, a red waistcoat and a green sash round the waist. All wear the conical hat. In cold weather the dark bandit's cloak is also seen. As we approach Rome the country becomes more and more barren, the mountains recede, and the extended plains have a desert, uncultivated look. Towns and villages become so thinly scattered that it seems as though the whole region were depopulated. The road is rather narrow, and, as the country is in many places exceedingly marshy, a great portion of it has been paved. For many miles before we enter Rome we do not pass a single town or village. At length, some three hours before we reach the city, the dome of St. Peter's is seen looming in the distance. One church after another appears, and at length the whole city lies spread before us. Many ruins of aqueducts and buildings of every kind showed at every step what treasures of the past here awaited us. I was particularly pleased with the old town gate, Lateran, by which we entered. It was already quite dark when we reached the Dogana. I at once betook myself to my room and retired to rest. I remained a fortnight at Rome, and walked about the streets from morning till night. I visited St. Peter's almost every day, and went to the Vatican several times. All the squares in Rome, and there are a great many, are decorated with fountains, and still more frequently with obelisks. The finest is the Piazza del Popolo. To the right rises the terrace hill Piscino, rich in pillars, statues, fountains, and other ornaments, a favorite walk of the citizens. On this hill, which is arranged after the manner of a beautiful garden, we have a splendid view. The city of Rome here appears to much greater advantage than when we approach it from the direction of Naples. 
we can see the whole town at one glance, with the yellow Tiber flowing through the midst, and a vast plain all around. The background is closed by beautiful mountain ranges, with villas, little towns, and cottages on the declivities. But I missed one feature, to which I had become so accustomed, that the most beautiful view appeared incomplete without it, the sea. To make up for this drawback, we here encounter, wherever we walk, such a number of ruins, that we soon become forgetful of all around us, and live only in the past. The Piazza del Popolo forms the termination of the three principal streets in Rome. On the largest and finest of these, the Corso, many palaces are to be seen. The splendid post-office, of white marble, rises on the Colonna Square. Two clocks are erected on this building, one with our dial, one with the Italian. At night both are illuminated, a very useful as well as an ornamental arrangement. The ancient column of Antoninus also stands in this square. The façade of the Dogana boasts some pillars from the temple of Antoninus Pius. The objects I have just enumerated struck me particularly as I wended my way to St. Peter's. I cannot describe how deeply I was impressed by the sight of this colossal structure. I need only state the fact that on the first day I entered the cathedral at nine in the morning, and did not emerge from its gates until three in the afternoon. I sat down before the pictures in mosaic, underneath the huge dome and the canopy, then I stood before the statues and monuments, and could only gaze in wonder at every thing. The expense of building and decorating this church is said to have amounted to forty-five million eight hundred and fifty-two thousand dollars. It occupies the site of Nero's circus. Two arcades, with four rows of pillars and ninety-six statues, surround the square leading to the church. The façade of St. Peter's is decorated with Corinthian pillars, and on its parapet stand statues fifty-two feet in height. The entrance is so crowded with statues, carved work, and gilding, that several hours may be spent in examining its wonders. The traveller's attention is particularly attracted by the gigantic gates of bronze. I cannot adequately describe the splendour of the interior, nor have I seen anything with which I could compare it. The most beautiful mosaics, monuments, statues, carvings in bronze, gilded ornaments, in short, everything that art can produce, are here to be found in the highest perfection. Oil paintings alone are excluded. Everything here is in mosaic. Even the cupola displays mosaic work instead of the usual fresco paintings. Immense statues of white marble occupy the niches. Beneath the cupola, the finest portion of the building, stands the great altar, at which none but the Pope may read Mass. Over this altar extends a giant canopy of bronze, with spiral pillars richly decorated with arabesques. The weight of metal used in its construction was 186,392 pounds, and the cost of the gold for gilding was forty thousand dollars. The entire canopy is worth above one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The cupola was executed by Michelangelo. It rests on four massive pillars, each of them furnished with a balcony. In the interior of these pillars, chapels are constructed, where the chief relics are kept, and only displayed to the people from the balcony at particular times. I was in the church at the time when the handkerchief, which wiped the drops of agony from our Lord's brow, and a piece of the true cross, were shown. The pulpit stands in a very elevated position, and was executed in bronze by Bernini, 219,161 pounds of metal, and 172,000 dollars, were spent upon its construction. In the interior is concealed the wooden pulpit, from which St. Peter preached, and immediately beside this we find a pillar of white marble, said to have belonged to Solomon's temple at Jerusalem. The lions on the monument of Clement the Thirteenth by Canova, are considered the finest that were ever sculptured. I was fortunate enough to penetrate into the catacombs of St. Peter's, a favor which women rarely obtain, and which I only owed to my having been a pilgrim at Jerusalem. These catacombs consist of handsome passages and pillars of masonry, which do not, however, exceed eight or nine feet in height. A number of sarcophagi, containing the remains of emperors and popes, are here deposited. 
The roof of St. Peter's covers an immense area, and is divided into a number of cupolas, chambers, and buildings. A fountain of running water is even found here. From this roof we have a splendid view as far as the sea and the Apennines. We can descry the entire Vatican, which adjoins the church, as well as the Pope's gardens. I ascended to the ball in the great cupola, where there is nothing to be seen, as there is not the slightest opening, much less a window, left in it. Nothing is to be gained by mounting into this dark, narrow receptacle but the glory of being able to say, I have been there. It is far more interesting to look down from the windows and galleries of the great cupola into the body of the church itself, for then we can estimate the grandeur of the colossal building, and the people who walk about beneath appear like dwarves. Two noble fountains deck the square in front of St. Peter's, and in the midst towers a magnificent obelisk from Heliopolis, said to weigh 992,789 pounds. Near this obelisk are two slabs, by standing on either of which we can see all the rows of columns melted, as it were, into one. My journey to Jerusalem also obtained for me an audience of the Pope. His Holiness received me in a great hall adjoining the Sistine Chapel. Considering his great age of seventy-eight years, the Pope still has a noble presence and most amiable manners. He asked me some questions, gave me his blessing, and permitted me, at parting, to kiss the embroidered slipper. My second walk was to the Vatican. Here I saw the immense halls of Raphael, the staircases of Bramante and Bernini, and the Sistine Chapel, containing Michelangelo's masterpieces, the world-renowned frescoes. The immense wall behind the high altar represents the Last Judgment, while the ceilings are covered with prophets and sibyls. The picture gallery contains many works of the great masters, as does also the gallery of vases and candelabra. The Biga chamber, the Biga is an antique carriage of white marble, drawn by two horses. In the gallery of statues, the figure representing Nero as Apollo playing on the lyre is the finest. In the gallery of busts, those of Menelaus and Jupiter preeminently attract attention. The name of the Laocoon cabinets indicates the masterpiece it contains, as also the cabinet of the Apollo Belvedere. The latter statue was found in Nero's baths at Porto d'Anzio. The celebrated torso of the Belvedere, a fragment of Greek art, which Michael partly used as his model, is placed in the square vestibule. Never was flesh so pliably counterfeited in stone as in this masterpiece. A long gallery contains a series of tapestries, the designs for which were drawn by Raphael. The Vatican contains ten thousand rooms, twenty large halls, eight large and about two hundred small staircases. The Curinal Palace, the summer residence of the Pope, lies on the hill of the same name, Monte Cavallo, which is quite covered with villas and beautiful houses, on account of the salubrity of the air. I visited most of the private palaces and picture galleries. The principal are the Colonna Palace, on the Quirinal Hill, the Barberini Palace, where we find a portrait of Raphael's mistress, Fornarina, painted by himself, and an original picture of Beatrice Senzi, by Guido Steri. The finest of all the Roman palaces is that of the Borghese. From its form, which resembles a piano, this building has obtained the name of Il Sembalo de Borghese. The gallery contains sixteen hundred paintings, most of them masterpieces by celebrated artists. The Farnese Palace is remarkable for its architecture, and the Stopani for its architect, Raphael. Besides these, there are many other palaces. I saw but few villas, for the weather was generally bad, and it rained almost every day. I visited the Villa Borghese on a Sunday, when there is a great bustle here, for a stream of people on foot, on horseback, and in carriages, sets in towards its beautiful park, situate just beyond the Piazza del Popolo, on the same way that the crowds flock to our beloved Prater on a fine day in spring. I also saw the Villa Medicis and the Villa Pamphili. The latter boasts a very extensive park. I took care to visit most of the churches. My plan was to go out early in the morning and to inspect several churches until about eleven o'clock, 
when it was time to repair to the galleries. When I went to the principal churches, for instance, those of St. John of Lateran, St. Paul, St. Maria Maggiore, St. Loris, and St. Sebastian, I was always accompanied by a guide specially appointed to conduct strangers to the churches. I could fill volumes with the description of the riches and magnificence they display. The church of St. John of Lateran possesses the wooden altar at which St. Peter is said to have read Mass, the wooden table at which Jesus sat to eat the Last Supper, and the heads of the disciples Peter and Paul. Near this church, in a building specially constructed for it, is the Scala Santa, holy staircase, which was brought from Jerusalem and deposited here. This is a flight of twenty-eight steps of white marble, covered with boards, which no one is allowed to ascend or descend in the regular way, every man being required to shuffle up and down on his knees. Near this holy stair a common one is built, which it is lawful to ascend in the regular way. The Basilica of St. Paul lies beyond the gate of the same name, in a very insalubrious neighborhood. It is only just rebuilt after having been destroyed by fire. The Basilica Maria Maggiore, in which is deposited the Holy Gate, has the highest belfry in Rome, and above its portico we see a beautiful chamber where the new Pope stands to dispense the first blessing among the people. In the chapel of the crucifix five pieces of the wood of the Saviour's manger are preserved in a silver urn. St. Lorenzo, a mile from the town, is a very plain-looking edifice. Here we find the Campo Santo, or cemetery. The graves are covered with large blocks of stone. St. Bessoriana is also called the Church of the Holy Cross of Jerusalem, from the fact that a piece of the cross is preserved here. Besides the letters I-N-R-I, -I, some thorns, and a pail. St. Sebastian in the suburbs, one of the most ancient Roman churches, is built over the great catacombs, in which 174,000 Christians were buried. The catacombs are some stories deep, and extend over a large area. All the above-named basilicas are so empty, and stand on such lonely spots, that I was almost afraid to visit them alone. The handsome church of Santa Maria in Travastare contrasts strangely with the quarter of the town in which it lies. This part of Rome is inhabited by people calling themselves descendants of the ancient Trojans. Santa Maria ad Martires, or the Rotunda, once the pantheon of Agrippa, is in better preservation than any other monument of ancient Rome. The interior is almost in its pristine condition. It contains no less than fifteen altars. In this church Raphael is buried. The rotunda has no windows, but receives air and light through a circular opening in the cupola. The best view of ancient Rome is to be obtained from the tower of the Senate House. From this place we see stretched out beneath us Mount Palatine, the site of ancient Rome, the capital in the midst of the city, the Quirinal Hill, Monte Cavallo, with the summer residence of the Pope, the Esquiline Mount, the loftiest of the hills, Mount Aventine, the Vatican, and lastly, Monte Testaccio, consisting entirely of broken pottery which the Romans throw down here. I also paid a visit to the Ponte Publicus, the most ancient bridge in Rome, in the neighborhood of which Horatius Cloclis achieved his heroic action, and the Tullian prison, beneath the church of St. Joseph of Falniani, where Jugurtha was starved to death. The staircase leading up to the building is called the Steps of Size. The capital has unfortunately fallen into decay. We can barely distinguish a few remains of temples and other buildings. Of the graves of the Scipios I could discover also little more than the site. The subterranean passages are nearly all destroyed. The Mars field is partly covered with buildings, and partly used as a promenade. Cestius's grave is uncommonly well preserved, and a pyramid of large square stones surrounds the sarcophagus. The aqueducts are built of large blocks of stone fastened together without mortar. They are now no longer used, as they have partly fallen into decay, and some of the springs have dried up. The hot baths of Titus are well worth a visit, though in a ruined condition. Here the celebrated Laconian group was found. Near these baths is the great reservoir called the Seven Halls of Titus. 
One of the greatest and best preserved buildings of ancient Rome is the amphitheatre of Flavius, or the Colosseum, once the scene of the combats with wild beasts. It was capable of holding eighty-seven thousand spectators. Four stories yet remain. This building is seen to the greatest advantage by torchlight. I was fortunate enough to find an opportunity of joining a large party, and we were thus enabled to divide the expense. The triumphal arch of Titus, of white marble, covered with glorious sculptures, the arches of Septimus Severus, that of Janus, and several other antique monuments, are to be seen near the Colosseum. The beautiful bridge of St. Angelo, constructed entirely of square blocks of stone, leads across the Tiber to the castle of the same name, the tomb of Hadrian. The emperor caused this large round building to be erected for his future mausoleum. It is built of immense stone blocks, and now serves as a fortress and a state prison. The temple of Marcus Aurelius is converted into the Dogana. That of Minerva Medicia lies in the midst of a vineyard, and is built in the form of a rotunda. The upper part has sunk in. There are twelve obelisks in the different public squares of Rome, all brought from Egypt. I still have to mention the one hundred and eight fountains, from which fresh water continually spouts into the air. Foremost among them in size and beauty is the Fontana Trevi. I was prevented by the bad weather from making trips to any distance, but one afternoon I drove to Tivoli. The road leading thither is called the Tiburtinium. After travelling for about six miles, we became conscious of a dreadfully offensive sulphurous smell and soon found that it proceeds from a little river running through the Solfatara. A ride of eighteen Italian miles brought us to the town of Tivoli, lying amidst olive woods on the declivity of the Apennines, and numbering about seven thousand inhabitants. Towards evening I took a short walk in the town, beneath the protection of an umbrella, and was not much pleased. Next morning I left the house early, and proceeded to the temple of Sibylla, built on a rock opposite to the waterfall. Afterwards I went to view the grotto of Neptune, and that through which the Arno flows, rushing out of the cavern to fall headlong over a ledge of lofty rocks, and form the cascade of Tivoli. The best view of this fall is obtained from the bridge. Besides many pretty minor cascades, I saw a number of ruins. The most remarkable among these was the villa of Mycenaeus. End of section 39。section 40 of a visit to the holy land。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。Chapter Twenty of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part Two, by Ida L. Pfeiffer, November Twenty Third. At six o'clock this morning, I commenced my journey to Florence with a Venturino. Almost the whole distance, the weather was in the highest degree unfavorable. It was foggy, rainy, and very cold. A journey through Italy during autumn or winter is far from agreeable for there are generally cold and rain to be encountered, and no warm rooms to be found in the inns, where fires are never kindled until after the guests have arrived. And the fires they light in the grates are, after all, quite inadequate to warm the damp, unaired rooms, and the traveller feels scorched and cold almost at the same moment. The floors are all of stone, but a few straw mats are sometimes spread beneath the dining-tables. The landscape through which we travelled to-day did not possess many attractions. For about forty miles, as far as Ronciglione, we saw neither town nor village. The aspect of Ronciglione is rather melancholy, though it boasts a broad street and many houses of two stories. But the latter all have a gloomy look, and the town itself appears to be thinly populated. We passed the night here. According to Italian custom, I had made a bargain with the proprietor of our vehicle for the journey, including lodging and board. I was well satisfied, for he strictly kept his contract. But whoever expects more than one meal a day under an arrangement of this sort will find himself grievously mistaken. The traveller who wishes to take anything in the morning or in the middle of the day must pay out of his own pocket. 
I found everything here exceedingly expensive and very bad. November 24th. Today we passed through some very pretty, though not populous, districts. In the afternoon we at length reached two towns, namely Fitterbo, with thirteen thousand inhabitants, lying in a fruitful plain, and Monte Fiescone, built on a high hill, and backed by lofty mountains, on which a celebrated vine is cultivated. At the foot of the hill, near Monte Fiescone, lies a small lake, and farther on, one of considerable size, the Lago di Balsana, with a little town of the same name, once the capital of the Volci. An ancient fortress rises in the midst of this town, surrounded by tall and venerable houses as with a wreath. We now had to cross a considerable mountain, an undertaking of some difficulty when we consider how heavy the rain had fallen. By the aid of an extra pair of horses we passed safely over the miserable roads, and took up our quarters for the night in the little village of Lorenzo. We had already reached the domain of the Apennines. November 25th. We had now only a few more hours to travel through the papal dominions. The river Sentino forms the boundary between the states of the church and Tuscany. The greater portion of the region around us gave tokens of its volcanic origin. We saw several grottoes and caverns of broken stone resembling lava, basaltic columns, etc. The Dogana of Tuscany, a handsome building, stands in the neighborhood of Ponte Sentino. The country here wears a wild aspect as far as the eye can stretch. It rests upon mountains of different elevations. The little town of Radico Fani lies on the plateau of a considerable hill, surrounded by rocks and huge blocks of stone. A citadel or ancient fortress towers romantically above the little town, and old towers look down from the summit of many a hill and cliff. The character of the lower mountain range is exceedingly peculiar. It is split into gaps and fissures in all directions, as though it had but recently emerged from the main. For many hours we almost rode through a flood. The water streamed down the streets, and the wind howled round our carriage with such violence that we seriously anticipated being blown over. Luckily the streets in the Tuscan are better than those in the Roman territory, and the rivers are crossed by firm stone bridges. November 26th. Today our poor horses had a hard time of it. Up hill and down hill, past yawning chasms, our way lay for a long time through a desert and barren district, until, at a little distance from the village of Juan Covento, the scene suddenly changed, and a widely extended, hilly country, with beautiful plains, the lovely town of Siena, numerous villages, great and small, with homesteads and handsome farms, and solitary churches built on hills, lay spread before us. Everything showed traces of cultivation and opulence. Most of the women and girls we met were employed in plaiting straw. Here all wear straw hats, men, women, and children. At five in the evening we at length reached Siena. Our poor horses were so exhausted by the bad roads of the Apennines that the driver requested leave to make a day's halt here. This interruption to our journey was far from being unwelcome to me, for Siena is well worthy to be explored. November 27th. The town numbers 16,000 inhabitants, and is divided almost into two halves by a long, handsome street. The remaining streets are small, irregular, and dirty. The Piazza del Campo is very large, and derives a certain splendor of appearance from some palaces built in the Gothic style. In the midst stands a granite pillar, bearing a representation in bronze of Romulus and Remus suckled by the she-wolf. I saw several other pillars of equal beauty in different parts of the town, while in Rome, where they would certainly have been more appropriate, I did not find a single one. All the houses in the streets of Siena have a gloomy appearance. Many of them are built like castles, of great square blocks of stone, and furnished with loopholes. The finest building is undoubtedly the cathedral. Though I came from the city of churches, the beauty of this edifice struck me so forcibly that for a long time I stood silently regarding it. It is, in truth, considered one of the handsomest churches in Italy. It stands on a little elevation in the midst of a large square, 
and is covered outside and inside with white marble. The lofty arches of the windows, supported by columns, have a peculiarly fine effect, and the frescoes in the sacristy are remarkably alike for the correctness of outline and brilliancy of color. The drawings are said to be by Raphael, and the freshness of color observed in these frescoes is ascribed to the good qualities of the Siena earth. The mass books preserved in the sacristy contain some very delicate miniatures on parchment. Some of the woods in the neighboring hospital are also decorated with beautiful frescoes, which appear to date from the time of Raphael. The grace and beauty of the women of Siena have been extolled by many writers. As today was Sunday, I attended high mass for the purpose of meeting some of these graceful beauties. I found that they were present in the usual average, and no more, beauty and grace are no common gifts. In the afternoon I visited the promenade, the Prado de Liza, where I found but little company. A fine prospect is obtained from the walls of the town. November 28th. The country now becomes very beautiful. The mountains are less high, the valleys widen, and at length hills only appear at intervals, clothed with trees, meadows, and fields. In the Tuscan dominions I noticed many cypresses, a tree I had not seen since my departure from Constantinople and Smyrna. The country seems well populated, and villages frequently appear. At five in the evening we reached Florence, but I did not arrive at Madame Mokali's hotel until an hour and a half later, for the examination of luggage and passes, and other business of this kind, always occupies a long time. The country round Florence is exceedingly lovely, without being grand. The charming Arno flows through the town. It is crossed by four stone bridges, one of them roofed and lined with booths on either side. Florence contains eight thousand houses and ninety thousand inhabitants. The exterior of the palaces here is very peculiar. Constructed chiefly of huge blocks of stone, they almost resemble fortresses, and look massive and venerable. The cathedral is said to be the finest church in Christendom. I thought it too simple, particularly the interior. The walls are only whitewashed, and the painted windows render the church extremely dark. I was best pleased with the doors of the sacristy, with the celebrated works of Luca del Robin, and the richly decorated high altar. The Battisterio, once a temple of Mars, with eight very fine doors of bronze, which Michelangelo pronounced worthy to be the gates of paradise, stands beside the cathedral. The other principal churches are St. Lorenzo, also with a white interior and gray pillars, containing some fine oil paintings, and the Chapel of the Medici, a splendid structure, decorated with costly stones, and monuments of several members of the royal family. St. Croce, a handsome church, full of monuments of eminent men, is also called the Italian Pantheon. The sculptures are beautiful, and the paintings are good. The remains of Michelangelo rest here, and the Bonaparte family possess a vault beneath a side chapel. Another chapel of considerable size contains some exquisite statues of white marble. St. Annunciate is rich in splendid frescoes, those placed round the walls in the courtyard of the church, and surrounded by a glass gallery, are particularly handsome. On the left, as we enter, we find the costly chapel of Our Lady della Annunziata, in which the altar, the immense candelabra, the angels and draperies, in short, everything is of silver. This wealthy church contains an addition, with some good pictures and a quantity of marble. St. Michel is outwardly beautified by some excellent statues. The interior displays several valuable paintings and an altar of great beauty, beneath a white marble canopy in the Gothic style. St. Spirito contains many sculptures, among which a statue of the Saviour in white marble claims particular attention. All these churches are rather dark from having stained windows. Foremost among the palaces we may reckon the Palais Pitti, built on a little hill. This structure has a noble appearance, constructed entirely of pieces of granite. It seems calculated to last an eternity. Of all the palaces I had seen, this one pleased me most. It would be difficult to find a building in the same style which should surpass it. As a rule, indeed, I particularly admired the Florentine buildings, which seemed to me to possess a much more decided national appearance 
than the palaces of modern Rome. The picture gallery of this palace numbers five hundred paintings, most of them masterpieces, among which we find Raphael's Madonna della Sedia. Besides the pictures, each apartment contains gorgeous tables of valuable stone. Behind the palace, the Boboli Gardens rises, somewhat in the form of a terrace. Here I found numerous statues distributed with much taste throughout the charming alleys, groves, and open places. From the higher points a splendid view is obtained. The palace degli Uffizi on the Arno has an imposing effect, from its magnificent proportions and peculiar style of architecture. Some of the greatest artistic treasures of the world are united in the twenty halls and cabinets and three immense galleries of this building. The tribuna contains the Venus de' Medici's, found at Tivoli, and executed by Cleomenes, a son of Apollodorus of Athens. Opposite to it stands a statue of Apollino. In the center of the hall of the artist's portrait gallery we find the celebrated Medician vase. The cabinet of jewels boasts the largest and finest onyx in existence. The Palazzo Vecchio resembles a fortified castle. The large courtyard, surrounded by lofty arcades, is crowded with paintings and sculptures. A beautiful fountain stands in the midst, and two splendid statues, one representing Hercules and the other David, adorn the entrance. The glorious fountain of Amanato, drawn by seahorses and surrounded by tritons, is not far off. In the Gerardesca Palace we find a fresco representing the horrible story of Ugolino. The Palazzo Strozzi should not be left out of the catalogue. It has already stood for three hundred and sixty years, and looks as though it had been completed but yesterday. In the Specola we are shown the human body and its diseases, modelled and waxed by the same artist who established a similar cabinet at Vienna, in the Josephinium. In the Museum of Natural History stuffed animals and their skeletons are preserved. The traveller should not depart without visiting the workshops for hard stones, where beautiful pictures, table slabs, etc., are put together of Florentine marble. Splendid works are produced here. I saw flowers and fruits constructed of stone, which would not have dishonored the finest pencil. The enormous table in the Palace degli Uffizi is said to have cost forty thousand ducats. Twenty-five men were employed for twenty years in its construction. It is composed of Florentine mosaic. This table did not strike me particularly. It appeared overloaded with ornament. Of the environs of Florence I only saw the Grand Duke's milk farm, a pleasant place near the Arno, amid beautiful avenues and meadows. Departure from Florence, December 3rd. At seven in the evening I quitted Florence, and proceeded in the mail carriage to Bologna, distant about eighty miles. When the day broke we found ourselves on an acclivity commanding a really splendid view. Numerous valleys extending between low hills opened before our eyes. The snow-clad Apennines formed the background, and in the far distance shone a gleaming stripe, the Adriatic Sea. At five in the evening of December 4th we reached Bologna. This town is of considerable extent, numbers 50,000 inhabitants, and has many fine houses and streets. All of these, however, are dull, with the exception of a few principal streets. Beggars swarm at every corner, an unmistakable token that we are once more in the states of the church. December 5th, this was a day of rest. I proceeded at once to visit the cathedral, which is rich in frescoes, gilding, and arabesques. A few oil paintings are also not to be overlooked. In the church of St. Dominic I viewed with most interest the monument of King Enzio. The picture gallery contains a St. Cecilia, one of the earlier productions of Raphael. A fine fountain with a figure of Neptune graces the principal square. In the Palazzo Publico I saw a staircase up which it is possible to ride. The most remarkable edifices at Bologna are the two square leaning towers at Porta Romagna. One of these towers is five, and the other seven feet out of the perpendicular. Their aspect inspired me with a kind of nervous dread. On standing close to the wall to look up at them it really appeared as though they were toppling down. In themselves these towers are not interesting, 
being simply constructed of masonry and not very lofty. The finest spot in Bologna is the Campo Santo, the immense cemetery, with its long covered ways and neat chapels, displaying a number of costly monuments, the works of the first modern sculptors. Three large and pleasant spots near these buildings serve as burial places for the poorer classes. In one the men are interred, in the second the women, and in the third the children. A hall three miglia in length, resting on six hundred and forty columns, leads from this cemetery to a little hill, surmounted by the church of the Mandana di St. Luca, and from thence almost back into the town. The church just mentioned contains a miraculous picture, namely a true likeness of the Virgin, painted by St. Luke after a vision. The complexion of this picture is much darker than that of the commonest women I have seen in Syria. But faith is everything, and so I will not doubt the authenticity of the picture. The prospect from the mountains is exceedingly fine. I returned in the evening completely exhausted, and in half an hour afterwards was already seated in the post-carriage to pursue my journey to Ferrera. On the whole the weather was unfavorable, it rained frequently, and the roads were mostly very bad, particularly in the domains of the Pope, where we struck fast four or five times during the night. On one occasion of this kind we were detained more than an hour, until horses and oxen could be collected to drag us onwards. We were twelve hours getting over these fifty-four miles, from six in the evening until the same hour in the morning. December 6th. This morning I awoke at Ferrera, where the carriage was to be changed once more. I availed myself of a few spare hours to view the town, which on the whole rather resembles a German than an Italian place. It has fine broad streets, nice houses, and a few arched ways in front of them. In the center of the town stands a strong castle, surrounded by fortifications. This was once the residence of the bishop. At nine o'clock we quitted this pretty town, and reached the Po an hour afterwards. We were ferried across the stream, and now, after a long absence, I once more stood on Austrian ground. We continued our journey through a lovely plain to Rovigo, a place possessing no object of interest. Here we stayed to dine, and afterwards passed the Adige, a stream considerably smaller than the Po. The country between Rovigo and Padua was hidden from us by an impenetrable fog, which prevented our seeing fifty paces in advance. At six o'clock in the evening we reached Padua, our resting place for the night. Early next morning I hastened onwards, for I had already seen Padua, Venice, Trieste, etc., in the year 1840. I reached my native town safely and in perfect health, and had the happiness of finding that my beloved ones were all well and cheerful. During my journey I had seen much and endured many hardships. I had found very few things as I had imagined them to be. Friends and relations have expressed a wish to read a description of my lonely wanderings. I could not send my diary to each one, so I have dared, upon the representations of my friends, and at the particular request of the publisher of this book, to tell my adventures in a plain, unvarnished way. I am no authoress, I have never written anything but letters, and my diary must not, therefore, be judged as a literary production. It is a simple narration, in which I have described every circumstance as it occurred, a collection of notes which I wrote down for private reference, without dreaming that they would ever find their way into the great world. Therefore I would entreat the indulgence of my kind readers, for, I repeat it, nothing can be farther from my thoughts than any idea of thrusting myself forward into the ranks of those gifted women who have received in their cradle the muse's initiatory kiss. End of section 40. End of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy. Read by Sibella Denton, in Carrollton, Georgia, October 2007.